is looking at Ephesians chapter number two. Uh, let me just show you something here to consider. Uh, none of us got here without Paul on epistles. We're still preaching what Paul wrote, right? And certain men along the way have been instrumental in teaching us the Bible. And uh, you get taught and then you teach others and those kind of things. And uh, so as a result, uh, there are certain individuals that uh, mean something to you because you recognize without them you would not be where you are. Somebody somewhere gives you a leg up all along the way, uh, no matter who you are. Look in Ephesians chapter number 2 and pick it up. Thank you, honey. Pick it up in verse number 20. Lord, help me. <clears throat> now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God, verse 20, and are built upon a foundation of apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye are builded together for an, inhabita for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now all I want to draw to your attention is, is that somebody else started it before you were here. In Ephesians 4, he said he gave to you a gift. Come in Ephesians 4, same uh, book there, look if you will. The Lord ascended, is he not he that he descended first in the lower parts of the earth? Verse number 10, he that descended the same also that ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And then what does he do? And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for what? The perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now the reason I give you those things is to let you know that nothing you're hearing is new or that is some new revelation. You're hearing what I have been taught. And you hear in these other preachers what they have been taught. And what you have is, is a Bible in front of you to find out if what they've been taught is right or not. And so uh, for many of you that don't know this, come if you will to 2 Timothy chapter number 1. Uh, many of you don't know this, but Dr. Ruckman uh, taught all of us at least some portion of things. And even if some of you uh, despise him, don't like him, don't care for him or whatever, you believe a lot of the things he taught me. And so as a result of that, you can't take credit for anything that you are, anything that you've done, because if there's nothing new under the sun, God's the one that gave anything that's been given to anybody. And so you have to give uh, homage to, or you have to give special recognition to, the people that taught you so you can teach others. Nobody in and of themselves can teach themselves and be an effective teacher. You have to have put your behind in a uh, pew or in a chair and let somebody else be over you in order for you to be over other people. If you've never been under somebody being taught, you're not fit to be over somebody in teaching. And one of the reasons I respect the old preacher is, is because he had something like 10 years of extra, uh, uh, of extra education that he spent time subjecting himself to all the so-called great minds and all the stuff when he got his PhD, a regularly certified, living, died in the wool, uh, 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 accredited PhD from a regular institute. You say, well, why would he do that? To show you he had the ability to sit under somebody before he could be over somebody. That's a principle of authority that all of us have to learn. You have to understand no man is an island in and of himself. And the danger is, is that if you haven't ever been taught by somebody, you're going to teach whatever you want to teach, and that puts the people that are listening in danger. That's why the Lord spends a lot of time in the New Testament correcting the religious people. And the reason is, is because the religious people are simply parroting what they'd been told instead of doing what God was trying to teach them. Uh, he goes to the, book who, uh, to the book of John, and in the book of John, Nicodemus, Nicodemus is there. And you know what he says to Nicodemus? He said, you being a master, you don't know the things I'm telling you? You haven't read Psalms 22? You haven't read the things that are in Isaiah 53? I mean, how do you not know about a new birth and you claim to be a, quote, master, end quote, in the Scriptures? How is it you claim to be a master teaching other people and you can't even understand what I'm saying to you? Now, the thing that's important about that is, ladies and gentlemen, is, is whenever you get to thinking you have a corner on the market and you're the only one and there's plenty of guys that are doing it now where they have their own little YouTube channels and their own little iPod cast or whatever they call those kind of things and they all of a sudden have become an authority in and of themselves, you better be careful. 
Everybody has to be under someone's authority and you have to be educated under someone's authority. Anything that I ever was able to accomplish was always under the authority of somebody that was over me. I had no authority to tell anybody what to do if I wasn't an authority being told what to do. I had federal law and state law and municipal ordinances that were over me. I had a sheriff over me and a director's over me and an undersheriff and chiefs over me and so on and so forth. How could I be over anybody if I wasn't under somebody? And the same thing goes for when we're talking about preaching and when we're talking about teaching. All these guys that preach to you here understand the principle of authority. They are not an island in and of themselves and the pulpit is not a place for you to promote your agenda. Now this goes for all congregations of all sizes and shapes and everything else. The pulpits in America have been used for years for personal and political agendas. It's outside the Bible. I showed you that clearly this morning. And what the Lord gave you, when He gives you a watchman, that watchman is going to take God's side, even if it means He stands against the congregation. I gave you that on Wednesday night. If you weren't here, come back and get that. I'm not going to run over it. But in the Old Testament, and history will repeat itself, in the Old Testament, when a prophet said, Thus saith the Lord, oftentimes it was that Old Testament prophet that was standing at a day and time where the people had refused to listen to God, and God sent a preacher, a prophet in there, to preach to them, and they rejected Him and threw Him in a pit or they killed him or they put him in jail or they smote him or they wound up uh, killing him dead or in a doornail. But why? Because they didn't want to hear what God said. But it doesn't change the fact that prophet is going to be on God's side. The right preacher is going to be the side of God no matter what the political temperature is going to be, no matter what the situation or circumstances is. Paul said, I've learned in whatsoever state I'm in there with to be content. Why? Paul said, I'm going to do what God tells me to do and I'm going to let God sort out the rest. Amen. Now, I could help a lot of you with your worry, with your concern, with your agitation, irritation, frustration, and all the other things that you have with other people. If you would learn to do, keep your eyes on your own paper, run your own race, quit worrying about whether anybody else is doing it or not. Leave that to God. Just do what God called you to do. It's a happier way to live a Christian life. You spend too much time being involved in what you think everybody else ought to be doing, including political candidates, including people that are on the news media channel, including your boss and everybody Else. Put your head down, do what you're told to do, and quit worrying about whether or not somebody else in another division is doing it how you think it ought to be done. Amen. Your opinion doesn't matter. They're like armpits. Everybody has a minimum of two and they both stink at one time or another. You, amen, that's funny. You say, oh no, not my opinion. Yes, your opinion. Especially when your opinion's not asked for. Listen, unsolicited advice is never heeded. They don't want to hear you. You want to hear yourself talk. That's why you're always sticking your nose in everybody else's business. You're wanting to hear yourself talk. If they wanted to hear you talk, they'd ask you to speak. So if they didn't ask you to speak, even a fool's considered wise when he keeps his mouth shut. That's Proverbs. So what are you going to do? I ain't saying nothing. Don't speak unless I'm spoke to. You say, well, preacher, that's not very kind. Then say hello. But you don't have to put your two cents worth in everything. Now, what you've got here and what the, the Lord has allowed us to do here comes at a long line of people that have invested in people and invested in ministries. And in the end result is God's used those individuals along the way to try His best to give you something to give to other people. But it doesn't make us any more special than anybody else. It me simply means that we've graduated to the point, I honestly believe, where God says, okay, you're now ready to minister to others. It's no longer about you. You're mature now. It's time for you to get busy and get out there. You say, what? Now guess what you get to be? You get to hunker down and let somebody build on your back. You don't have to be the skyscraper anymore. You don't have to be in the limelight anymore. You don't have to be recognized anymore. You don't have to be appreciated anymore. You're not worried about whether everybody is leaning into the plow, leaning into the, to the straps, they're leaning into the harness, and they're just plowing out what God would have them to plow out. And you say, what are we? Our feet are down in the dirt. We're digging out what God told us to dig out. And anything that happens from here on out is somebody building on us. Because why? We don't exist anymore. We're here for everybody else. God's been good to us, God's helped us, and it's time we take our place in the dirt, reckon ourselves dead, and say, God, if you could do anything, use me as fertilizer and get something up there that'll bring glory and honor to you. Raise this thing up the way you want to raise it up and not make it look like, oh, get me up there on the pinnacle where I can be up there at the top, where I can get it. You know what the Lord said? Uh, I mean, what uh, the devil said to the Lord? He said, listen, wouldn't you like to be everything? He takes him up to the top of the temple and he says, listen, why don't you just jump down there and make a spectacle of yourself? You know what the the Lord said, it ain't my time yet. 
I came to die, not to win a battle, not to get recognition. Well, ladies and gentlemen, he came to die for me and you. And it's time that me and you die to ourselves and do it for other people. If there's anything this country needs right now, this county needs right now, this city needs right now, this town needs right now, your family needs right now, it's grown men being willing to do something for other people instead of for yourself. Amen. The world is right now built on everything. What's in it for me? What's in it for me? What am I going to get? What am I going to lose? What about me? 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 And the Lord said, y'all want to do something for me? Good. How about helping other people? You say, why? People talk about it, but rarely ever people ever do it. I mean, when it comes, push comes to shove, people talk about we want to do something to better the world and we want to do something to better the town and all that kind of stuff. Well, it might cost you an extra couple of hours. It might cost you some recognition. It might cost you a little loss of your reputation. Well, I, I, I mean, I don't want to do that. I don't care that much. See, people talk about wanting to make a change, but they rarely are willing to make the change. This church is ready to make the change. I believe that. You see, what's your vision for it? I got a vision of dry bones. I got a vision of a whole bunch of church people that are out there today. And in my mind's eye, believe it or not, you're going to think this is strange. I just saw a whole bunch of seeds in the ground out there today. I saw the plow, the field plowed up and turned over. And I saw a bunch of Christians down in there saying, okay, Lord, I'm planted now. Now, can you grow some roots in here? And can you make the seed come up? And when the seed comes up, Lord, can you let whatever shows up out there to be greater than anything I ever was? That's what I saw. I saw, I saw the maturity of a church saying, now it's about other people. You say, well, preacher, it took you 30 years. Okay. Good. 30 years of age, you're about ready to be mature enough to start doing something for somebody else instead of for yourself. That's a good thing. They say a man's not really a man until he's about 40 years of age. My dad believed that. My dad believed that I don't determine what my boy's going to be until he's about 40. Uh, because he said, what's going to happen? Between the time he's zero to 40, he's going to make a lot of messes and a lot of mistakes. Well, you're near about grown now. And so what do we need to do? Just keep on grinding at the wheel and keep on learning more and learning more? Or is it time for us to get busy and do something for somebody else? I think it's time to recognize we're built on apostles and prophets and we've been given pastors and teachers. And God says in this passage, we'll get it to uh, on Wednesday night. He said, go do the work of an evangelist. Go get them, boy. Amen. Go get them. Bring them in. Bring them in. Bring in the sheep. The field, he says, is white unto harvest. But the field's white. It's ready to be harvested. But where are the workers? Where are the workers? Where are the workers? You say what? Instead of having food brought to you, now it's time for you to take food to others. We should be right now five barley loaves and two fishes. We should be the little lad with the lunch. We should say, Lord, here's what I got. I got an alabaster box. Amen. Could you use that? Anything you can do with that? Lord, here I am. I mean, I'm, I'm getting on out there in years. Anything you can do with me, whatever you want to do with me, Lord, plow me under. Use me for fertilizer. I have thought about that this morning out there and I'm looking out there and I'm looking at that sea of people out there. I guess I probably saw more than was really out there, but it looked to me like, man, a bunch of ants on an ant hill out there. That place is covered up with people out there and some of them are weeping and crying and some of them tears of joy and thinking back and looking back and kids coming up and saying, preacher, I sure am glad and I sure am glad this place is here and some of them weren't even hatched out yet. Some of them were in the womb and they're, they're 15, 16, 17 years old now when we were building the other building, planting the book right here. And I'm looking at that thing and I'm thinking to myself, Lord, what are you doing? And he said, well, it ain't a building. He said, you're now ready to go into the world. Go get them. Go get them. We're putting this up so you can bring them in. I said, okay. He said, but that means they're all dead. I said, well, Lord, can these bones live? And he said, they can. And I can do more with a dead army than anybody can do with a live army. Amen. Amen. I said, but Lord, they're small in number. He said, Gideon's armor was small, army was small in number. You'll have to trust me. He said, I whittled them down from 32,000 to 3,000. And they went out to 300. And they went out there and faced 130-something thousand men. And they won the battle because I was on their side. Amen. I said, okay, Lord, enough said. I said, we'll be Gideon's army. I said, we'll get out there and do it. He said, well, you have to not be thinking of yourself. He said, when you get ready to lap up the water, you can't be burying your head in it. You got to be lapping up the water and be watching all the time. You got to be looking. You got to be thinking about the guy beside you and the guy over here and the guy that's going to do this and the guy that's going to do that. And you have to recognize, and, okay, Lord, I understand. I got it. Can these bones live? Thou knowest. Watch, the Lord said. I said, okay, breathe upon these bones, Lord. 
That's what I got this morning. You say, where'd that come from? You're a bunch of dead people. You say, why? Because you're mature. Because you're mature. That's a compliment. Y'all are looking at me like I'm, I'm cussing at you or something. <laughs> I'm not. I'm complimenting you. Paul said, reckon yourselves dead. There is no more of a fruitful Christian you have ever seen in your life than the Apostle Paul. And he said, I die how often? Daily. How about that? I just paid you a compliment. I called you. What'd you do? I went to church last night. What did the preacher say? He said, I was dead. <laughs> he said, I was dead. Really? That's terrible. No, it's a good thing. What? What do you mean it's a good thing? No, if we're dead, we're ready to be fertilizer for other people to grow. Boy, when you're like that, you know what? God can do something with you. Boy, when a, whew. Boy, when a church matures to a point like that, when you stop all the other foolishness, and you just reckon yourself dead, man, you talk about getting something done for God. You can't imagine what God can do with a dead person. You don't have to fool around with a corpse. You just got a dead person. You say, what do I, I can do anything with them I want to. They'll do anything I ask them to. They're counted as sheep for the slaughter. <laughs> Nay, in all these things, nothing will separate us from the love of Christ that we have and nothing from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Principalities and angels and powers and things above and things below and, and death and life and so on and so forth. Nothing can separate me. Why? Because I'm already dead. They tell me the greatest warriors, I don't know this. I never was in battle before. I had a few little scrapes here and there, but nothing like these soldiers and stuff. I have great respect for them. They tell me the greatest fighters in the world that have ever been out are people that already thought they were dead. My friend, and I don't mean to bring him up into, blow him up into bigger than life kind of a deal, but I had a tremendous amount of respect for him. But Brother Jim told me a few things that happened to him when he was over there. And he said, when I was over there, he said, I recognized one thing. He said, I was just as good as dead. And he said, I was more alive when I was as good as dead and I was less of a danger to myself when I wasn't trying to protect my life than I was when I started getting short. What they call getting short is I'm about to get out. And when you start to get out, you're thinking, well, I didn't think I'd make it and I thought I was going to be dead. But now all of a sudden I'm, I've got about 30 more days in country and I'm thinking, I don't want to be the FO, I don't, the, the Ford Observer. I don't want to be the guy out in the, at nighttime and, and doing all the ambushes and stuff like that. Uh, I'm, I'm 30 days from getting home. And he said, then you get careful. That's when you get killed. I wondered why a lot of the things that I was involved in early on in life, I look back on it now and it gives me the shudder. Sometimes I get a nightmare from it. I look back at that and I'm thinking, man, you got, what an idiot. How did you just rush into that? And why did you do that? I don't give you a heroic story, but I, I did some pretty stupid things. And if you knew about it, you'd say, you're an idiot. <laughs> yeah, as a 65 year old man, I am an idiot. But when you're 19, 20 and 21 and 22, you got an, you got enough. So you don't think nothing, you know, you think you're Superman. Bullets can't hurt you, you know. <laughs> you drive a car at 100 miles an hour into a pole and crash it and walk away from me thinking, well, of course I walked away from it, man. Don't you know I'm Superman? And you look back on it now and it's going like 35 is plenty fast for me, you know. <laughs> I'll get there when I get there. You get more like Barney Fife the older you get. <laughs> but when you're a young man, you reckon yourself dead. You say, what? You go in there. But you know the greatest uh, sacrifice to the Lord up there, you know what he does? When he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body. That's what I saw this morning. A living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable sort of service. I said, Lord, all we are is a bunch of seeds. He said, Amen. You say, what are seeds? They're dead. They're going in the ground. And when I touch them, they can bear life. Amen. But that seed's not a life in and of itself. And it's not anything until it's buried. You remember that's the Lord's testimony? He says to you, a seed's not any good until it goes in the ground and dies. You say, what? Out of death comes, boy, when a church dies. Ain't that an oddest sermon you ever hear from a Baptist preacher? They're all talking about dead churches, dead churches, dead churches, dead churches. I got a dead church. But it's not dead in the sense that most people make a dead church. I got a bunch of Christians here that love the Lord and believe the book and they're dead to themselves and dead to their wishes and dead to their dreams and dead to their ideas and dead to their reputation and they want to get something done in the last hours, the last minutes, the last seconds before the Lord blows the horn and they're dumping things right and left to try to get ready for something. You say, preacher, what do you got? I got a dead church and God loves to do things with dead people. You ever look at what he does with dead people? Dead people and demon possessed. You'd rather be dead, wouldn't you? 
You ever look at what he does with dead people? The Lord Lazarus is dead and he stinks. The Lord said, good. I do my best work when they're dead and stinking. You say, what happened? He pulls Lazarus up. You know what Lazarus' testimony is? You don't hardly know nothing about Lazarus until after he dies. You know what you know about him after he dies? When he comes out there and the Lord says, and you take the bindings off of him and unwind him and unwrap him and all that kind of stuff. Do you know he's sitting right there with the Lord when, uh, when they come to get the Lord and that kind of stuff? You know who they were after? They were after Lazarus. You say, why? He was raised from the dead in his testimony. You ever wonder about the guy that lost his coat and ran away naked? You know who that was? That's Lazarus. You say, why? In that passage, when you read the passage, the Bible will tell you the Pharisees wanted that boy because he was resurrected from the... because he was dangerous to him after he died and came back to life. You're the most dangerous thing in the world as a Christian when you're dead to yourself. You're the most dangerous thing in the world. You talk about being on the, de or the, ra the devil's radar. You're on the devil's radar the second you reckon yourself dead. He's like, oh, good night, man. I can't deal with that guy. You say, why? Because you become impervious to attacks. You become impervious to where we're going here in just a minute to do when he says endure afflictions. Well, it's a lot easier to endure the afflictions if you're dead. You know, one of the ways to understand you're not dead, afflictions start to bother you to the point that they change direction for you, like diverting the water. When you're dead, you know what happens? You realize you have one cause, and that cause is Jesus Christ. And what you recognize is, is he was down here, and he had to endure afflictions, and Paul was down here, and he had to endure afflictions. But they give you a perfect example, and that perfect example is, is that I'm, I'm dead to myself, and I'm living for Jesus Christ. I realize what I'm saying is for mature Christian Zonian. If I was to put it up out there, I would say, pardon me, I would say for, uh, for mature audiences only. You say, why? This is for dead people. This sermon's for dead people. Do you realize if you were dead, your problems would be over? I walk through graveyards a lot of times. Not, not now. I don't hang out in graveyards. I don't give you the right, the wrong impression. A lot of times I go preach in small churches and stuff and all that, and they have graveyards, you know, granny's laying out there and all these people are out there and they're laying around. I walk out there. It's the strangest thing in the world. I don't hear any of them talking. I can walk up there and say, man, you ugly and your mama dresses you funny. I don't hear nothing back. I don't hear a word. I say, man, that old preacher up there, you know, he's so-and-so and his wife did such and such. And you know how that deacon is. You know how him and his family are. And you know the preacher's kids the way they are because they hang out with the deacon's kids. And that grave just is quiet. It ain't saying nothing back whatsoever. It ain't bothering that dead person in the least. Boy, when a church gets dead, God can get something done. You say, why? world can talk about you, laugh at you. King James, Bible believer. What are y'all, a cult over there? Uh, aren't y'all? Y'all worried about a mask? You worried about the bed? You worried about this? You worried about that? Why ain't you talking? Speak to me! We dead. We don't talk. You ain't bothering us. Keep on running your yak. You ain't bothering us. You're just sucking up air, man. You say, what? I'm in a place of bliss. I'm impervious to attack. The afflictions come. You have to endure the afflictions. You say, but preacher, they hurt. They don't hurt a dead person. I, I don't mean to be crude with what I'm about to say, but it illustrates my point. We're going to talk about enduring affliction here in a couple hours when I get around to it. You folks got me so full up today, man. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. I was about ready to run around. You'd have thought you'd have to have a snatch rope to pull me out of the mud out there. I was ready to go jump in that stinking little hole over there around that little foundation thing that had a little water thing. I thought, you know what? I'm just going to just go jump in it like a kid and splash in it. I wanted to just jump up and down in that, in that <coughs> and splash water everywhere. You say, why? I'm just overwhelmed with all kind of emotions, man. I'm, just, every, I'm trying my best to just kind of settle it down, man. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, man, it's all over me. You know, the strangest thing in the world, ladies and gentlemen, is these people come around here and they laugh and they mock and they belittle and they make fun and things like that. And the Lord said, it won't affect you if you're dead. You're too much alive, aren't you, boy? I'm full to the brim. You say, why? Well, God's been good to me. Amen. But I still have a problem. I like me. Amen. Do you like you? <laughs> he likes to be alive, don't he? Well, I got the answer to your problem. You have to be willing to be dead. 
you get dead, you know what you'd be surprised? You'd be surprised what God can do with a dead church. I'm not talking about some kind of emotional foolishness and come out fooling. I, I remember one time at the thing, I'm tell you the illustration, I was debating on whether to do it or not, but I'm going to. Uh, we were uh, at a particular scene. I'll give you all the gory details and stuff, and it wasn't a real pleasant thing, and they're having to get somebody there, and they come out with that stupid little bag. And in my days, they had the, it, they're always black bags. They're not white bags, they're black bags. And it's on top of a gurney. And they can't quite get the fella because he's upstairs and he's a little bit on the uh, rotund side. And <coughs> they're trying, it's hot. It's, it's 95 degrees outside. It's 105 inside. It's hot. And they're trying to get him from where he's at there off the bed and get him into the hallway, little small landing there to go down this little stairs in this shotgun house and all that. And I'm sitting there looking and I'm thinking, boy, that's how are they going to do that? And at first they took the gurney up there and then... They were like, this ain't going to work. There ain't no way to make it fit in there to be able to, to get it in there. So they, next thing you know, they're taking the bag. And we got everybody blocked off. And the guy said, hey, boss, can you watch the door for us for a minute? And I said, sure, man, sure, we'll, we'll do that. So they get him up there, and they finally get him in there. And they're sweating. I mean, to beat the band. It's hot, man. I mean, there ain't no way to make it cool. You could think ice cream, and it ain't going to be. I mean, it didn't melt before you can get to your mind. It was so hot in that room, man. Blazing hot. And I remember them, okay, man, I'm ready. On three, you know, one, two, three. And then I heard boom, you know, and I thought, oh, my Lord, what in the world? So I got about halfway up the stairs and the guy went, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I said, what happened, man? He goes, we dropped him. You say, what did the dead man say? How dare you be so disrespectful to me? How dare you treat me this way? I won't tell you how they got him down the stairs. <laughs> but, but if you can think slide or something along those names. <laughs> gently, gently. But what you going to do? You say, well, why are you telling me that now? Why would the Lord bring that to my mind? I can see it just as plain as if I'm standing there. And I'm looking at that thing and I'm thinking, well, I guess that's one way to do it. And then they put him on the gurney and then they put the little thing over there with the name of the funeral and that little felt thing uh, or, or lure thing. And then they very dignified, you know, walked out of there. And when he walked out, I looked at the guy and I went. <laughs> Here's my illustration. The dead man never said a word. He was abused and taken advantage of and caught in a bad situation and thrown in a bag like trash and carried down the stairs and out onto a gurney and got dropped along the way. And Can I ask you a question? How come it is that what other people do to you bothers you so much? You sure you want to be a part of a dead church? I do. I do. I want to be a dead man. I want to be dead and deed to sin and dead to myself. You ever think of that? You say, what is that? Man, God can do something with dead things. God can do something with dead things. Let me show you a couple of verses of Scripture here. I've taken too much of your time already. Look, if you will, please, in 2 Timothy. Now, that Bible says in chapter 4 there, he said, endure afflictions. When he says, preach the word, do the work of the, uh, the uh, watch thou in all things, he said, endure afflictions. Second Timothy chapter number 1, look if you will please in verse number 8. <clears throat> Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partakers of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God who hath saved us and called us to a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which is given to us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Can I pause there for just a moment? Notice what you're ashamed and why you're ashamed. And notice the afflictions come not from being stupid, but because of who you're affiliated with. Affiliations matter. Who you're associated with matters. 
1 Corinthians chapter number 5 clearly says that you can't not have affiliations with people that are sinners and lost people and people that commit every kind of sin you can commit. That's clear in the Bible because Paul said if you think that's how it's going to be, you must needs go out of the world. I mean the people that build the roads and people that run the gas station, people that run the hotel, people that run the restaurant we ate at this afternoon, lost people, lost as a golf ball in high weeds. But you know what he says? He said that any man that calls himself a brother know not to have fellowship. You don't live in a sanctified, sanitized world right now. You say, what's going to happen to you? When you live for Jesus Christ, you don't have to open your mouth. Just do what God tells you to do. You know what he said? Be a partaker of the afflictions. It's a lot easier to partake of those afflictions and endure those afflictions if, in fact, you happen to be uh, dead. Look in chapter number 2. Chapter number 2, look at verse number 3. Now therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We won't go through the whole passage. Look in verse 10. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation which in Christ Jesus is with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying for if we be uh, 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 we shall also what? That's not just eternal. You want to really have life? You want to really enjoy life? You want to really enjoy your last years here on earth? Come to Romans chapter number 8. You really want to do that? You say, what am I? I'm dead to public opinion. I'm dead to popular opinion. I'm dead to politics. Some things I can't control. There's no point in putting my two cents worth in. All I want to do is, is live for Jesus Christ. <coughs> and I'm dead to all that other stuff. You say, what'd that be? That's bliss. You're Teflon man and woman. You're walking through the world and slinging mud on you and it's falling right off. You say, why? Because you're living the right kind of life. Once you're dead, the Bible says you really start living. Wouldn't it be a blessing for you if some of you, wouldn't you think, have you ever thought about it? Please don't, don't. This is, uh, I guess you would say, a rhetorical in nature. Uh, haven't you ever thought you'd be better off if you were dead? You wish sometimes you were completely dead. You'd get out of the mess you're in. You ever thought that? I've thought that. Sure I have. I thought, you know what? I'm going to go to heaven. <laughs> How much better does it get than that? I'm not going to decide to do that, but I'm just saying I've thought that before. But it's a biblical principle. As a Christian, you don't start living until you're dead. Y'all think it's strange, don't you? That thing right there is always trying to tell me what to do. Every time I turn around, I ain't got to worry about you telling me what to do. Me tells me what to do. I wake up in the morning. As soon as I get up in the morning, it wants attention right off the bat. I mean, it tells me. My bladder talks to me. Then my feet talk to me because I didn't put on my shoes. And, I, and then, you know, my feet are tore up or whatever it might be. And then my back says, well, why am I aching back? And then, you know, and then my stomach growls. And then, it's, well, how about a little bump of caffeine and all that kind of stuff? And the spirit's down there going, hey, man. How about thanking God you got through the night without somebody cutting your throat? Amen. How about thanking God you and your wife are still alive? You got another day to face and all that kind of stuff. If I was dead, I wouldn't be thinking about nothing except what God wanted me to do. You say, what are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about a dead church. I'm talking about a dead church. Can you imagine me going and preaching a revival meeting and saying, okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to here to preach to you the greatest revival sermon. You need to die. And if you could be a dead Baptist church, then boy, you could really get something done for the Lord. <laughs> They'd run you out of town on a rail. They want you to come up there and rah, rah, shish, boom, ba, and get out the shakers and get everybody moving and get them jumping and running around and jumping as if that that means that you're, that you're really alive. No, you're just a bunch of zombies trying to act like you're alive. If you're really alive, you're dead. If you're really up, you're down. If you're really in charge, you're the servant. If you're the greatest, you're the least. So, well, that's kind of paradoxical. No, that's God. That's God. God says, you're really alive, are you? Yeah, you're dead. He'll remind you sometimes you're not dead. Right? A sermon like this gets to come along. It's kind of like, well, I don't know, preacher, if I'd be covering that about afflictions and stuff. Put it in the Bible. You say, why? To show you you're not dead. You ever have somebody talk about you and makes you good and mad? You say, well, you ain't dead. You ain't dead. You say, why? You think their opinion matters. You think God's going to have a public opinion poll when you get up there to heaven? You think he's going to ask your enemies what they think of you? <coughs> I don't think he is. Don't worry, it's not the virus. I got something hung up. Look, if you will, please, in Romans chapter 8, look in verse number 17. 
the Apostle Paul. Now then it is no more I, that's the Spirit, that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that will, and notice he says, good, how to perform that which is good, I find not. Jump all the way down to verse number 36. Not 36. Verse number uh, 22. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. And I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity the law of sin which is in my member. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this? There it is. The affliction, the trouble, the problem, the difficulty. You say, what, is, what are you trying to tell me, preacher? I'm telling you I want to pastor a dead Baptist church. Because God can do great things with dead people. 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. Afflictions. Enduring afflictions. <laughs> um, Drina, will you get me one of them fishermen's things, please? 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 9, or something along thereabouts. For I think that God hath set for us, verse 9, apostles last as it were appointed to what? Are you with me? We're in chapter 4, 1 Corinthians 4, verse number 9. Or as it were, last. we're last and we're appointed to what? Yeah. Death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, to angels and unto men. For we are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise. He's being sarcastic now. Thank you, I'll take care of it. Uh, we are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even to this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless and persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made a filth of the world and all scouring of all things unto this day. Now, ladies and gentlemen, he just said to you, it started off, he wouldn't endure those things if it wasn't for verse 9. I forgot we're last and accounted for death. Last and accounted for death. Paul said that's why we're so much alive. We're alive, ladies and gentlemen, because we're dead. Take your Bible, if you will, please, and come to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians 11. We're talking about enduring affliction. Something that a lot of preachers don't tell you about is if the Christian life comes without affliction. No, it comes with all kinds of affliction. Paul said uh, that in his flesh there was a constant thorn. Paul was not just under affliction from the brethren. Paul was under constant affliction from a thorn that God had sent the messenger of Satan to buffet him, to keep him down. He was in a constant state of affliction. How did he endure that? He was dead. He learned the secret to power was death. He learned, ladies and gentlemen, I apologize for this. I know it's rude, but just give me a chance to help this thing in my throat. Paul learned this. Paul said, I want to learn the fellowship of his suffering. But I want the power of His resurrection, fellowship of His suffering, being made conformable to His death. We're talking about dying. Man, that just flies in the face. It's kind of like, wait a minute, man, I don't want, I don't want to die. Well, you don't want to be much of a Christian. You want real liberty? You die to yourself. Then when you find out, because the devil will make sure to it, a little bird will tell you. Somebody will drop a letter in your email box. Somebody will send you some kind of way, something, something somebody said or something somebody did. And it'll be somebody that you think really cares about you and that kind of thing. And they'll see to it that you get the information. You say, why is that? That's the Lord's tester. The Bible said he was despised and rejected. The Bible said when he was reviled, he reviled not again. How did he do that? He came born wrapped in a manger and laid in swaddling clothes. He was dead from the moment he was born. You know the secret to a Christian life? You say, yeah, preacher, it's uh, the Bible and prayer and preaching and all that. And all the secret of the Christian life is dying. Not physical death. It's being dead to your wishes and your desires and your routines and your reputation and what you think's right for everybody else and doing whatever God would have you to do for Him. That's real liberty. You want a cause to live for? There's no greater cause than Jesus Christ. Amen. Preacher, you sound like a fool. Okay, but I'm telling you the truth. Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? But preacher, you're talking, you're telling us we ought to be dead to ourselves and dead to our ambition and dead to our drive and dead to what we want and dead to ourselves. And, no, I'm just telling you the Bible. I'm not telling you that. The Bible's telling you that. Notice, if you will, please, are you in 2 Corinthians 11? Look in verse number 23. 
Are you ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, and labors more abundant, and stripes above measure, and prisons more frequent, and deaths, and deaths, and deaths, and deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice suffered a shipwreck, a night and a day in the, have I been in the deep, and journeyings often, perils of waters. I'll read it fast because I've read it a few times. I remind myself of the ministry. Paul said, you know, are they ministers? He's laughing at them. He goes, I'm a minister. I pastored the First Baptist Church downtown. Ran 30,000 members. I'm a minister. I gave this amount of money to the cooperative program. I'm a minister. We support this many missionaries. I'm a minister. We have this many ministries. I'm a minister because I get to go these many places. Paul said, are they a minister? I'm a minister. Well, Paul, that don't look like the minister. Paul said, yes, the ministry of a dead man. I'm a dead man. I'm, I'm just doing what the Lord does. You say, what's he doing? I'm the, I'm the scarecrow. Where's Miss F Flying Monkeys? Look what he says. The Bible says, And journeyings often perils of water, perils of robbers, and perils of mine own countrymen, perils of heathen, perils of... I thought the Christian life was being out of peril. Well, Paul said, In perils, not pearls, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among false brethren, weariness, painfulness, watchings often, hunger, thirst, fastings often, cold and nakedness, besides those things without cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak? I am not weak. Who is offended? And I burn not. I must needs glory. I will glory in the things which concern mine infirmities. And then he goes on in chapter number 12 to say, I knew a man and in the body, out of the body I cannot tell, who was caught over the third of him, behold great things. And the Lord sent a messenger of Satan, a thorn in the flesh. I besought the Lord three times. And the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Say, Paul sought him three times and the Lord said no. No, Paul sought him three times. The Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. Here's your answer. I ain't taking it away. You say, why? Just to remind you, you did. Would that be all right with you? For God to use you? So how do I get God to use me? Die. Be dead to yourself. Lord, do with me what you want to do with me. Your salvation begins at Calvary. It begins based upon a dead man. Colossians chapter number 1. Colossians chapter number 1. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. The preacher, what's your vision for the church? Dead people. There's a movie out years ago. I can't remember what the thing is. I don't, I don't do all that junk anymore and all that. But I, I'm not trying to be spiritual. But I, I, I can't remember. But they made a joke out of that thing all the time. Some little kid or something saying, I see dead people. You know what the Lord's looking for? He's looking for dead people. Really, that's what he's looking for. He wants to come into this church and go... I see dead people. There's nothing more glorious in His sight than dead people. Or He wouldn't make such an emphasis on it. I've given you already five or six verses of Scripture on it. Surely you're convinced by now, if God says it once, it's important. But if He says it a half a dozen or more times, I'd say it's probably real important. It's probably one of the least taught things in the Bible for the New Testament church. They're all talking about living life and living life and living life. You're burdened down with the fact that you're alive so much, you're trying to keep yourself alive, and you're struggling to stay alive. And that's why God says, you know why you're never happy? Because you ain't dead. If you were dead, you'd be happy. You know, you know why Paul said, I've learned in whatsoever state I'm in there with to be content? Because he's dead. I know how to obey, so I know how to abound. Well, I'd be a lot happier if I abounded. No, then there's the burden of protecting what you're abounded. <laughs> working to get it and working to keep it. Then working to get rid of it. And then getting mad because whatever you spent for it and paid for it, you don't get a dime on a dollar for whatever it was, but it cost you, you know, 40 hours a week for 10 weeks to be able to get it. And then you get ready to sell the stuff and it means something. And somebody comes in there and says, I'll give you $10 for it. And you're like, that thing cost me $1,000. Okay, then you can keep it. I'll give you $10 for it. Otherwise, trash man come take it out, bust it up, cut it up with a chainsaw. We talked to a fellow not long ago. He said, my wife was talking. They said, what did you do with your uh, father's stuff and this and that and the other? And we tried to sell what we could do and all that. He goes, yeah, I had to do that with my, my dad's stuff. He said, he had this oak furniture, man. I mean, it's absolutely gorgeous stuff. I mean, it was so big. It was special built. It was in his house and all that. In order to get the stuff out of his house, he said, we had to take a chainsaw to it. <laughs> My wife said, a chainsaw? He goes, yeah, we cut it up in the house to get it out of the house. 
oak furniture that cost thousands of dollars. He said, we cut it up and threw it on a trailer and hauled it to the trash dump. There's your life. There's your life. Get it, have it, enjoy it while you have it, but don't get attached to it. You're dead. You say, what is that? I'm, I'm the keeper of dead things. It ain't mine. It belongs to him. Somebody's going to get it one day. I ain't leaving that for my kids. You ain't leaving it for nobody. When you're dead, you ain't going to care. You ain't going to come back from the grave and go, oh no, uh, you out of my will. <laughs> It ain't going to be that way at all. You're going to be like, hey, we're going to give it to so-and-so. Over my dead body. <laughs> they going to do what they want to do when you're dead. Amen. And they're doing right now what they want to do. So you just well be dead. Look, if you will, please, if you're in the book of Colossians, just a couple more of these, if you would. Colossians chapter 1, this is the Apostle Paul's testimony. Paul said, Who now rejoice in my sufferings, verse 24, for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for the body's sake, which is the church. You know what the Apostle Paul said? Come to Philippians 1 quickly. Philippians chapter number 1. You know what the Apostle Paul is saying to you? Paul saying, you can tell the evidence in my body of afflictions. Of what? He said, endure afflictions. He's, that's part of the Christian life. Somebody needs to tell you that if you're going to live for Jesus Christ, it's going to cost you something. You're going to get some marks. You're going to get some scars. You're going to get some whip marks. You say, why? It's not for being a jerk. It's just for living for Jesus Christ. They say, hey, we're having a party. We're having a get-together. Once you come, you're going to have a drink or two with us. You know, kind of relax and kick back. No, thank you. So, I mean, you're, we're just doing business and all that. Well, you have your way of doing it, and I have my way of doing it. No, thank you. Not interested. Why you got to be like that? I don't know. I respect your right. If you want to drink, drink. I don't want to drink. Amen. You say, why? One's dead and one ain't. One's interested in fitting in with the crowd. The other one's like, I'm dead. It don't matter. <laughs> you ever seen them take in a coffin? I mean, they do hit you with embalming fluid, but you ever seen them take somebody's mouth and open it up and pour a liquor in there? You say, why would they do that? Yeah, why would they do a dead man? What is there in a live man that desires liquor? A dead man's like, I don't want that. I'm dead. You say, why? I'm dead to him. My body is his temple. He hangs out in dead things. If I'm reading the Bible right, maybe I'm reading the Bible wrong. Look at verse number 29. For unto you it is given on behalf of Christ, 129, not only to believe on him, but also to what? Suffer for his sake. You know all those verses, having the same conflict you saw in me and now here to be in me. The Apostle Paul tells you the same thing in 2 Timothy chapter number 2. He said, if we suffer, we shall also reign. If we deny him, he'll deny us the right to rule and reign. That's all throughout your Bible. Let me give you a couple more here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And so, well, preacher, I, I, don't, I don't know that I've ever heard some of your visitors and you're thinking, I never heard nobody talk like that before. I mean, that's kind of morbid and all that kind of a deal. Not if you're a Christian. As a Christian, you know what you long for? You, you long for being able to be dead to yourself. And you say, why? Yourself is an offense. I read the passage this morning in my regular Bible reading. I read the passage this morning. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. You mean there's times I don't please God? And the Lord said, yeah. When you're in that dead man making that dead man do what you want him to do and said, well, yeah, you don't please me. He said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. They that love the world are enmity with God. I'm his enemy? Yeah, but if I'm a dead man, I'm his friend. Ain't that something? Dead to the world. Everybody else thinks you're lifeless and you're no good and you're rotten and all that. Lord said, boy, now there's somebody I can do something with. He don't even think for himself. You ever seen a dead man in the coffin? Well, the way I see it. <laughs> no, they don't do that. You see what happens? A dead man has his thoughts. Or what do you think? Or what do you want me to do? 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. Come down, if you will, please. 
uh, to verse 3, <clears throat> that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we're appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer what? Look at it. I'm 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm sorry, verse number 4. I apologize. It was my, my bad. My, my uh, whatever you call that. My mistake or whatever. You know what he just said to you? He said, we told you. We haven't been lying to you. You're going to suffer tribulation. Give you one more. How about that? 1 Peter chapter number 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. We'll close with this one. You should preach what are you talking about? Enduring affliction. The life of a dead man. The life of a dead man. Boy, wouldn't that be a blessing to be able to be dead? Boy, what a blessing. You know what happens when you come to a funeral? That can be the most wicked, ungodly, foul individual that you've ever seen in your life. And they rarely ever talk bad about a dead man. You know what will happen, ladies and gentlemen, if you find that people are talking about you all the time, once they find out you're dead and it doesn't cause a reaction out of you, you'd be surprised how they quit talking about you. You'd be surprised how no matter how wicked and vile you might have been, you'd be surprised how when they recognize they don't get any rise out of you and you're dead, they'll even talk good about a dead man. It's your response to it that makes them recognize you're worth continuing to talk about because you've got to respond. You're dead. The preacher doesn't it agitate you. Yeah, the live part of me, but the dead part of me, you know what it says? Everybody's entitled to their opinion. I guess we'll see when we get the judgment seat. What's going on in your life right now that if you were at the judgment seat, you'd say, God, I'd like to weigh in now that we got all eternity watching. You know what so-and-so said about me? Could I ask you a question, dead people? Could I ask you a question? Why does what somebody else is doing or done bother you so much? I got one answer for you. You're alive unto yourself. Ma'am, you want to get along better with your husband? Reckon yourself dead. Sir, you want to get along with your wife? Reckon yourself dead. You say, why? That way when she says things she shouldn't say, it's like... Now, you better not reckon yourself dead when the roof needs repair. <laughs> or you will be dead. Somebody be calling me up. Preacher, you know a guy? I do. I need a speed bump. You need a speed bump? Yes, sir. Sister, your driveway is not but about 12 yards long. I know. People speeding up and down my driveway. I need a speed bump. What did you do to your husband? <laughs> well, preacher, you said, yeah, 1 Peter 4. I love the honesty of the Bible. If I, I, I've thought about it, it'd be the devil in me if I did it. I've thought about it if I ever got to go to a charismatic church. I wouldn't, but, it, but if I ever did. And I wouldn't go there to preach. But if I ever got the chance, and they said, you can preach for an hour. <laughs> I sure be tempted. You say, what would you preach there? I'd preach this passage right here. I'd say, I'm going to preach a passage in the Bible you've never heard. You say, well, I'm going to preach to you the Christian life. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice and you are partakers of his sufferings. I would say this, and happy are you when for his sake you're being uh, made fun of and all that, but rejoice. The spirit and power and glory of God rest upon you. It has nothing to do with your tongue. It has to do with your suffering. Which one of you has suffered for the cause of Christ? That'd be my message. That'd be where I'd start. I'd say somebody's been teaching you that you had the power of God on you because you could ostrela shantai, untie a bow tie economy Honda or get slain in the spirit and jump around like a worm on the end of a hook getting ready to get eaten by a bass or to be flopping around and that kind of thing. Have to have somebody throw a sheet over you so that you make sure that you're uh, not, you know, modest apparel and all that other kind of stuff. And I said, I'm here to tell you that the Lord said to you, you're supposed to be suffering. If you really got the power of God resting on you, you should be happy in the fact that you're suffering and that you're getting tribulation. Could I see a show of hands? How many of you really are filled with the spirit? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, the altar's open. <laughs> That's the life of a dead man. He said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is as though some strange thing happened to you. <laughs> but rejoice. You say, Why? You're getting what he got. You know what they gave? I, I know they come, well, you make this big deal, and I'll give you this, and I'm closed. I was thinking about it the other day. 
I wish I could paint. If I could paint, what I'd do is I'd have a cold night time in September, October, and then I'd have the shepherds out there, and I'd have them out there talking. Now, you remember the kings, when they come, they bring gold and frankincense and myrrh, right? And you know, everybody knows all the story about that, and the gold for the king and the deity and the frankincense and myrrh for the embalming and all that kind of stuff. What in the heck, cat hair did the shepherds bring? What would a shepherd bring? They wouldn't bring a little drummer boy. Chow. I play for him, pa rum pa pum pum He wouldn't be playing no drum for Jesus. He played drums for Molech to drown out the cries of the babies, to get noise going so your conscience don't get you. Think about that tonight when you go to the house. I was thinking to myself, what would them shepherds bring? And here's what I'd have if I could paint. I'd paint that cold night fog coming out of her mouth and he, so cold the angel when he says, fear not, I'd have fog coming out of his mouth, man. Little snowflakes falling down like a Hallmark movie thing. And then I'd have them coming out there and they'd say, let us go now and see or let us now go and see. And I'd have them walking over there and they think, well, what are we going to bring him? And the guy says, I don't know. I got a nail. Another guy says, I got a nail. Another guy says, well, I got a nail. It's just iron, but it's all we got. I'd have them kneeling right there in front of the Lord Jesus Christ and they'd say, listen, we're just a bunch of shepherds and all our sheep are out there and we don't have anything, but we got three nails. And here's our gift. And I'd have them presenting them to him, three spikes as a little baby. That's what you gave him. You didn't give him gold and frankincense and myrrh. You gave him three nails and a tree of his own making. You say, what was the gift to the baby? I'd have them shepherds saying, this is all we have. You know, when you came to Jesus Christ, what you had, you were dead in trespasses and sin. You know what you gave him? Lord, would you die for me? My life ain't worth living without you. Here's three nails. Lord said, I'll take them. It means more to me than gold, silver, and precious stone. Yeah, me too. I appreciate that. You know what he said to me? I died. Can you die? I died willingly. Will you die willingly? Will you die to yourself? Will you die to the world? Will you die to your family? Will you die to your friends? Will you die to your freedom? Will you die to your reputation? Will you die to your ambition? Will you die to your drive? Will you die to what it is you're wanting out of life? Would you be willing to die? I don't know. But they tell me the greatest warriors are the one that count themselves dead. And Paul said, put me at the head of the pack. Every day when I wake up, I recognize I'm alive and I say, I'm dying today. I die daily. Father, bless your word. and Thank you for it. Thank you for a whole host of dead people here tonight. Lord, the reason I know they're dead is because they would not be in church on a Sunday night, especially as pretty as the weather is outside. 65 degrees and below 50 or below 60 percent humidity and feels like air conditioning on out there and all kind of stuff on TV and restaurants are open and life is, seems to be moving along well. Lord, I know if they weren't dead, there's a number of other places they would rather be than here. And I thank you, Lord, for allowing me to be a pastor of a bunch of dead people and giving us an opportunity to go into the ground now and to be able to get planted. And we pray that you might resurrect us to newness and life and help us to be able to do something greater than we've ever done before and let people build upon our shoulders and build upon our backs and help us to willingly lay down there so that you can raise up something here. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.